Okay, good morning everybody. Let's uh, get started. Thanks for some of you for braving the ice and snow and making it in this morning. Uh, I will reward you by talking about all cool things about robots. Um, before we talk about robots, however, <coughs> let's talk about the final project. We're in the period of the course now where you're submitting weekly interim videos. And uh, the interim video that you're working on this week is a short video showing a little bit of user testing. Um, you're showing testing with one of your two user test, uh, one of your two uh, alpha users, alpha testers, if you like. Um, we're not looking to see that you've implemented all the functionality of your final project, just the first increment of the functionality, whatever that happens to be. So some evidence that you've added in a little bit of functionality and some evidence of your user interacting with your system as a whole and also this new functionality. The goal here is not to demonstrate to us that your system is 100% obvious to the user. The user gets confused and has to back up or ask you for directions. That's perfectly fine. What you're trying to show us is that you're able to see in the user interaction where the weak points in your system are uh, so far. Uh, just a short video. Um, at the very end, uh, we want you to flash up a spreadsheet that shows that you're starting to collect some quantitative uh, data about user interaction. So once you get your user uh, interacting with the system and you're recording them with your phone, you should also be writing down uh, how many seconds does it take for them to finally get their hand over the device. How long does it take for them to get their hand centered over the device to trigger your system moving from state one to state two? If they get distracted and their hand wanders away from the center of the field of view and it switches back to state one, how long does it take them to reverse that uh, and so on? Again, it doesn't have to be perfectly accurate here, but shows that you're starting to record some of this timing information. For this video, you're just recording it manually, so set up a stopwatch and watch the number of seconds and write them down as your user interacts and then type them into the spreadsheet, add them to the video. Later on, uh, over Thanksgiving, when you're doing a little bit more user testing, you're gonna be adding in some additional code so that, that those timing measurements are being taken automatically by your code. Make sense? Any questions about interim video two? Final project in general. Uh, sorry, there's a typo here. This is mon next Monday night, not Wednesday. Okay. How did things go with your two guest lecturers last week? Okay. Good. All right. So, um, as I mentioned, I was away uh, in China. I was um, traveling with an undergraduate here, David Matthews, who published a paper at a robotics conference in Macau, China. And David is only the second person yet to get a robot to uh, respond appropriately to natural language commands and to respond naturally to natural language commands that the robot has never heard before. It's called word to vec to behavior. If you're interested in David's work, you can Google word to vec to behavior and have a look at the paper that he published. It's actually a, can be considered a human-robot interaction project. One of the ways in which we'd like to be able to interact with our robots is not by programming them, but by interacting with them in uh, natural language. So uh, I think Joshua walked you through and finished lecture 22 on human-robot interaction. Any questions about the material covered there? Okay. Then we will move on today to the last lecture in this long series that we've been looking at with, uh, with the common theme of looking outward. We've been looking at increasingly sophisticated technologies that are being, belt, uh, that are being built to stitch themselves more tightly and intimately into the physical world. They are collecting information directly from the real world and in the case of mobile robots. They are also able to act on the world and observe how the world pushes back. So like uh, we started the course where we talked about users interacting with technology, our human users 
have built up over decades of interactions with the environment. They build built up mental models about what happens when they act on the environment and observe the sensory repercussions of those actions. Right? We have lots of expectations about how this feedback loop works with the real world. If we build technology, our users often bring a lot of those expectations to bear on their feedback loops they establish with technology. We've been looking at uh, robots so far, where we started by looking at the Breitenberg vehicles that similarly act on their world which generates a sensory repercussion of that action. For example, receiving more light on their left light sensor than on their right light sensor, which causes them to change how they act. Uh, and around and around we go. Last time you looked at human robot interaction. So when a robot does something, the human senses it, the human acts in response to whatever the robot did, and the robot senses the repercussion of those actions. Finally, in the final lecture here, we're going to look at robots that interact with each other, and not surprisingly, also establish this ongoing feedback loop where the actions of one robot partly impinge on the sensors of the other robot, and also the actions of that robot become the sensory repercussions of the other robot, and again, around and around we go. How do we go about designing swarms of robots, robots that work together, so that when they establish this feedback loop, that the uh, robot swarm is able to do something that is difficult or impossible for robots to do together? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had hundreds of robots outside this morning clearing off the snow and ice. We're not quite there yet, but that's where we're heading with robot-robot interaction. Okay, so we'll talk about uh, robot swarms in a moment. We will probably finish that lecture today, and then we will switch over to our final theme on looking inward. It's kind of a central irony in technology development these days where Embed in uh, the fields of embedded devices and robotics, we're getting better and better at creating technology that's able to embed itself in the physical environment at the same time that more and more of us are becoming deeply entrenched in video games and virtual environments and our Twitter feeds and so on. So we're at the same time building very, very sophisticated virtual environments and building them to support the kinds of feedback loops that we expect when we interact with the real world at the same time that we're creating technologies to interact with the physical environment. And it turns out, not surprisingly, there are HCI lessons that are common to both of these enterprises. And we'll look for those as we start to look inward. But before we do that, let's go back to robot-robot interaction. You've seen zooids before. Okay, so uh, throughout today's lecture, just keep the right-hand cartoon in mind here. The actions of one robot become the sensory input to another robot. Here's a simple example of this from an HCI perspective. Okay, it's kind of a quick video. What are the sensor and motor systems of the zooids? How do the zooids get around on the tabletop here? They're not legged robots. They probably have wheels. They've got little wheels underneath somehow. What are the sensors that the zooids are using to decide how to move? 
Yes. Kind of looks like they might be all in view of a camera at the top, and they're all communicating with some central control thing that knows where they all are. Possibly there could be a camera above the table that is viewing all the robots and is sending that view somehow to the robots. It's not immediately clear, right? But however they're sensing, how are they using that sensing information? Or what, what information are they pulling out of their sensorium, what they can sense? They're not moving randomly. They're reacting somehow to what? Proximity to? What, to one in one another, right? You can see at some point they form a ring, so they're reacting to their, their neighbors and the relative positions of their neighbors. Perhaps they're also reacting to and responding to inanimate objects or not, or they're just blindly pushing forward. It's not, not immediately clear, right? But whatever is going on, there is definitely the ability to sense uh, a neighbor, an another robot like me, and then act accordingly and move oneself in a similar manner. You can imagine that the, the actual transformation from incoming sensory information into motor commands that are sent to the wheels aren't that sophisticated, not that different from the Breitenberg vehicles that we looked at uh, last week and the week before, right? Okay. Whether you'd actually want to have a bunch of these things running around on your tabletop as a lot of the HCI applications we've seen, I don't know, but at least it's, it's possible. Okay, so there's just a modern example. Now let's jump all the way back to the first example of interactive uh, robots. These are uh, Gray Walters tortoises. Uh, there were two of them, El Elmer and Elsie. Uh, there's Elsie down there on the bottom left without her shell, and there is a replica of Elsie in the Smithsonian uh, Institute. So the next time you make it to DC, do go and see uh, go and see Elsie. Both of these two robots were known as Machina Speculatrix, uh, and they were given that name as sort of a nod, first of all, to the biologically inspired nature of these robots. So most uh, all organisms have a genus and a species name. So in this case, our robots are machina speculatrix, or machines that we can use to speculate about robots, organisms, humans. OK. I think we've got the video here. In a simple villa on the outskirts of Bristol lives Dr. Gray Walter, a neurologist, who makes robots as a hobby. They are small and he doesn't dress them up to look like men. He calls them tortoises. And so cunningly have their insides been designed that they respond to the stimuli of light and touch in a completely lifelike manner. and she sees out of a photoelectric cell which rotates above her body. When light strikes the cell, driving and steering mechanism sends her hurrying towards it. But if she brushes against any object in her path, contacts are operated that turn the steering away. And so, automatically, she takes avoiding action. his brother in the darker vest. He works in exactly the same way. Dr. Walter says that his electronic toys work exactly as though they have a simple two-cell nervous system, 
and that with more cells, they will be able to do many more tricks. Already, Elsie has one up on Elmer. When her batteries begin to fail, she automatically runs home to her kennel for charging up, and in consequence, can live a much gayer life. Okay, this video was shot in the late 1940s, I think 19, yeah, 1948. Does Elmer and Elsie remind you of any more modern robots? The robot cleaning the room. Roombas. The Roombas. Anybody have a Roomba at home? How much more sophisticated is the Roomba than Elmer or Elsie? 80 years later, more or less, 70, 80 years later, we haven't come very far from Elmer and Elsie. As I mentioned at the beginning of the course, modern computers and robots were invented at the end of the Second World War. Those were the first two autonomous robots there. Computers have come a long way since then. Robots, not at all. Really, why? What's the difference? Making? Making bigger stuff, yeah. It's not necessarily the size. I mean, the use of computers to make this smaller, which made them cheaper, more powerful, energy efficient. So it just, I don't know, these are self problems. Absolutely. So in a big part of the history of computers was miniaturization, right, with transistors. Why didn't we miniaturize robots? Why don't we have micro robots swimming in your bloodstream, cleaning things up? Because making them smaller doesn't actually help them do their job better. Making computers smaller helps them do their job better, which is to perform computation quickly and efficiently. Making physical robots smaller doesn't necessarily make them better at their jobs. It depends on what they're doing. If it's cleaning your, fo your floor, then making them smaller doesn't necessarily help. Other ideas? Uh, I think that with computers, it's like you're designing systems. When with robots, they're just like elements of our system. And because ours is so messy and complicated, it's hard to make them work. Exactly. So we mentioned this at the beginning of the, of the class. When we have uh, autonomous robots, they're interacting actively with the physical environment, and the physical environment is always changing, right? It's very difficult to get things right. When we switch today and start looking inward at virtual environments, they're much more predictable because they are virtual. We have control over them using code. Robots that are operating in a home trying to clean up uh, the floors, there's pets, there's people moving around, there are changes in light levels, changes in moisture levels. The world is always changing and it's hard, much harder to figure out how to program a, a robot to deal with constant change in the physical environment. That's been one of the biggest impediments to making progress with autonomous robots. Things get even more challenging when, we, when there isn't just one robot interacting with envi an environment that changes somewhat. It is ex even more difficult to create an autonomous robot that is trying to do whatever it's supposed to be doing at the same time that there are other machines that are also moving around and changing and changing the environment and influencing humans nearby. Everything is in flux because everything is feeding back on other elements in the system makes things very difficult. So in order to think carefully about designing robots, we have to focus not so much in the internal complexity, but as HCI designers to think carefully about the kinds of positive and negative interactions that can occur in wherever we're gonna deploy the robot. What are the physical context uh, that matters in that situation and how do we design a robot to do so? And the fact that we haven't come a long way with robots sh shows that this problem hasn't really been solved well yet. Okay. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, Gray Walter built his tortoises back in the late uh, 40s. He published a paper in Scientific American a couple of years later in 1950, an imitation uh, of life and had some beautiful hand drawings of the tortoises in operation. On the left, we can see one tortoise reacting 
to a single light source and then another robot that is moving in such a way that it explores between two light sources. This should start to be sounding very familiar. Where have we heard this before? The Breitenberg vehicles. We actually looked at vehicle 2C, I think it was, who was the explorer. Gray Walter also included in this uh, article placing lights on the robots themselves. And depending on which Breitenberg vehicle you include inside the tortoise, you get complex quote unquote mating dances where the robots will approach one another, but the light sources then are obviously uh, growing from the perspective of each individual robot. And as the light grows too large, that causes the wheels to turn in such a way that the robots turn away from one another. They slow down as they move away from one another and they slowly turn and you can get very complex uh, relative motion between two or more tortoises. The light sources are placed on the tortoises themselves. For those of you that are interested in the early history of robotics, uh, Owen Halden published an interesting paper about uh, the, uh, the first few Gray Walter tortoises. So again, these were uh, robots built in the late 1940s and it was 40 years later that Breitenberg published his book in the 1980s on vehicles, which was an attempt to really pin down this idea of thinking carefully about the ways robots interact with their environment. And if we think carefully about the ways that they can interact with the environment, we can design relatively simple robots to do useful tasks like clean our floors. For those that have Roombas at home, how do they work? When they work. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. So in the late 90s, Roomba version 1.0 would move in a straight line until its right bump sensor bumped into something and it would turn to the left. If its left bump sensor was bumped, it would turn to the right and obviously head off now in a straight line in a different direction. And given enough time, it's not the most efficient way to cover uh, all areas of, of a floor, but, but it'll work. And when its battery gets low, it drives back to its battery hutch, right? Not unlike the tortoises. Okay, pretty simple. These days it does a little bit of machine learning and starts to actually map the room and, and do things in a little bit more efficient manner, but not too different from Gray Walter's tortoises. Okay, so let's move forward a little bit from, uh, from Gray Walter in the 40s and Breitenberg in the 80s to the late 80s and we'll have a look at the Boyds. The Boyds were an attempt to create agents where we didn't have just two tortoises, but we could potentially have hundreds or thousands of robots doing something over a very large area. But the moment you start to think about that physical context, one major challenge arises, which is traffic jams, right? If we're gonna have very, a very large number of robots interacting with one another, trying to do something that would be difficult or impossible for a few of them or just one of them, that's great. But there are additional problems if we're gonna field very large numbers of autonomous machines. Nature has already solved this problem wonderfully by inventing flocking and herding and schooling. Anybody know what particular species of bird this is? Starling. These are starlings, right? Which are wonderful at uh, performing very large scale collective behaviors without bumping into one another. Has anyone been able to pick out of the flock here the lead starling? Which one is deciding which way they all go? There is no, there is no leader. You mentioned they follow the one in front of them, possibly. So if there's no central leader, how are they managing to coordinate their action? Right? As you can imagine, they're probably carrying out some relatively simple heuristic. As Breitenberg taught us in the early 1980s, they are probably not doing very complex differential calculus. 
for the simple reason that they probably don't need to. But what? What are the simple heuristics that they are running here? The ones I've seen described before are like, stay close to your neighbors and avoid predators. Stay close to your neighbors and avoid predators. Sounds like a pretty good heuristic. So in the late 1980s, a computer graphics researcher tried to come up with some of these simple rules and place them into virtual agents and then animate these virtual agents to see whether they could do uh, what starlings and other uh, creatures could do. He was successful and they introduced this Boyd algorithm in the Lion King uh, Disney movie, uh, whenever that was, late 80s, early 1990s. And the Boyd's algorithms, and there's now hundreds and thousands of variants of this algorithm, sort of a standard uh, element in an animator's toolbox. On the right, you can see uh, a visualization of what the Boyd's algorithm is. In its basic, most basic form, there are three simple rules that each Boyd uh, uh, updates. First thing it does is to sense the relative position and heading of its neighbors. And the gray circle is meant to represent the sensing radius of each Boyd. Uh, a Boyd cannot see all 10,000 of its neighbors because if it, if it could, it would have to perform some complex calculation involving all 10,000 neighbors. So as long as it has a very relatively short sensing uh, radius, it's only gonna capture a few of its closest neighbors also kind of reminiscent of the KNN algorithm. In this example here, the green Boyd in the center has sensed within its sensing radius three other uh, Boyds. And if we look at these blue Boyds here and take the average center of mass of these three Boyds, the average center of mass is somewhere around here, very close to the green Boyd. So the green Boyd feels crowded there are too many of its neighbors too close, and it will slightly alter its heading to the right so that it turns away from the three neighbors on its left. At the same time that it is changing its heading to the right, um, this, we can imagine actually this is the same boy, but in this case it's seeing six neighbors. Uh, it takes the average heading of all of its neighbors and knows its own heading and alters its own heading to, slight, to match a slightly more closely to the average heading of its neighbors. Finally, it again takes the average center of mass of its neighbors, and if that center of mass is far away from it, it will, instead of turning away from the center of mass, alter its heading to turn slightly towards the center of mass. So at every time step of the Boyd algorithm, each Boyd is computing these three, is running these three algorithms, and each of these three algorithms output a change of heading. The Boyd sums up those three changes of heading and sets its new heading to that, to that average. Right? That's all the Boyd does, and every Boyd in the swarm is running exactly the same uh, algorithm. So uh, you can think of these as separation, alignment, and cohesion. What would happen if we took a Boyd swarm and we removed the separation component and all the Boyds only computed these two algorithms at every time step? What would happen if we randomly distributed a bunch of Boyds and then turned them on? How would the swarm react? There'd be a lot of collisions, right? They would all be changing their heading to, to head towards one another. So they would all be heading in more or less the same direction and they would eventually collide with one another. You can imagine that if we left out the cohesion component, how would the swarm react now? We distribute a whole bunch of voids over a certain area, turn them on and what happens? They'll all head in different directions. What happens if we leave out the, the alignment algorithm, but leave in separation and cohesion? How would the swarm react in this case? They'd oscillate in a ball, right? So they look much more like a, a swarming insects than swarming birds. There wouldn't really be any di uh, common direction that they're all heading in. 
Imagine that we now take the average heading changes output by these three algorithms and we placed a weight in front of each, all three of them, W1, W2, W3. And if we were to tune these weights, some larger than others, we can tune the behavior of the swarm. Okay. Uh, I thought I had the video. Oh, here we go. Okay. So you'll notice uh, in a moment the swarm running in a uh, herd of wildebeest here. And the wildebeest, as you'll see in the animation here, they're not just reacting to each other, but they are also reacting to the virtual uh, environment around them. How do the wildebeest react to the environment around them? A lot of alignment, right? So they're definitely waiting, uh, they're definitely waiting alignment pretty strongly in this case to get directional movement. What else are the wildebeest reacting to other than other wildebeest? The walls of the canyon. The walls of the canyon, right? So when we mentioned that the Boyds react to their neighbors, the neighbors don't necessarily need to be other Boyds. They can be if they can detect the fact that these Boyds are moving and have a heading direction, or they can simply be inanimate objects, or what else occurred in that short animation? What else were the wildebeest reacting to? A threat. Uh -huh. A threat or a predator, right? So if there is a quote-unquote Boyd nearby that seems to be doing something different from a wildebeest, maybe you weight separation a little bit stronger. So you can imagine taking the basic Boyd's algorithm as a base, and then as an animator, you could start to elaborate this algorithm a little bit so that the Boyd's react slightly different to other kinds of objects and agents in its environment. And again, without having to make things too difficult, by relying on the rich interactions that arise in a swarm of Boyd's, with few modifications, you can start to get relatively sophisticated behaviors, like herds of wildebeest that split up uh, and flow around a spur of rock, as you saw in the animation, or react more strongly to predators than they do to their conspecifics, and so on and so forth. Okay. I'm going to look at another more recent project. This is a research project known as Swarm Chemistry. Why is it called Swarm Chemistry? In this case, we're going to watch some animations of Boyd's again. But in this case, there are different subsets of Boyd's uh, represented by the color. And each color represents a different version of the Boyd algorithm running on that subset of Boyd's. And by changing the, di the relative distribution of different Boyd species, if you like, you get interesting global patterns emerging. So not a change in the complexity of the internal rules in the Boyds, just a change in the distribution of Boyds and the algorithms running on them. Let's focus on this set of blue and red Boyds. What do you think are the basic rules running in the red voids and the blue voids? Mm -hmm. 
It's kind of hard to reverse engineer the rule set running here given the global behavior. Exactly. So they're all running each, both, both species are running the same set of three rules with different weights. How do the red weight their rules different from the blue? Okay, yeah, so you can see that the red are more tightly clustered than the blue, which is a hint that the red are weighting cohesion more strongly than the blue voids are. Yep. Any other hints from the global behavior here of the relative weightings between these two species? Alignment. Alignment. How is alignment different? The red ones. Exactly. So the red move in the same direction together, whereas the blue more or less seems to stay in the same place. You'll notice that the blue and red collectively are respecting a fair bit of distance between each other more than within the same species. What does that tell you about the rule set inside of both? How are they achieving this separation zone between the two species? Separation between the separate species is way stronger than separation between their own species. Exactly. So separation across species is weighted more strongly than separation within species, which means there's a little bit of an elaboration in the rules here. So we know that these two species are able to detect neighbors of their own species versus neighbors of different species. Possibly, there might be other ways to do this, and one could pose the question, what is the simplest set of rules you could devise to get this global behavior? Assuming this was the behavior you were interested in. In swarm chemistry, usually it goes the other way around, which is we just create different distributions of uh, rules and sort of see what kind of global patterns uh, emerge. So here are two species that are moving collectively together. A little bit more difficult to figure out what's going on here. <clears throat> this work was published in the late 90s and into the 2000s, and a lot of researchers were very surprised at the kinds of sophisticated behavior you could get from a relatively simple set of rules, but it seems to fit with the general idea started by Gray Walter and continued by Breitenberg uh, and Craig Reynolds with the Boyds and now Swarm Chemistry, that you can get surprisingly sophisticated behavior with relatively simple rules if you think carefully about interaction. In this case, having multiple species that have different rules across the species, but same sets of rules within the same species. So you can imagine it's not that difficult to code up uh, a swarm chemistry. So if you're interested in this, I, I suggest giving it a try. It's a lot of fun. OK. OK, let's move back from virtual agents to robotics. And let's have a look at the Swiss robots. Why are the Swiss robots called the Swiss robots? Because if you put them in a messy environment, they will instinctually clean it up. Uh, how, do the, how do the Swiss robots work? Well, they're basically these sort of simple remote control cars that you see here with a little bit of additional electronics put on top. The basic control algorithm, as you see here, is a very straightforward Breitenberg vehicle. If there's stimulation front left, turn to the right. Stimulation on the right, turn left. If no stimulation, go forward. The difference here actually comes from the shape of the robot. You'll see that these robots have a flat nose, and then they have these two diagonal corners in front of the two wheels. Uh, 
If you put them in an environment with styrofoam cubes distributed throughout the arena, and like the Roomba, they will, they will just start moving in a straight line in whatever direction they were originally uh, heading. If they happen to hit a styrofoam cube head on, because of the shape of the front of their uh, of the car, the the two proximity sensors cannot see this central cube. So the robot continues moving forward and starts to push the styrofoam cube until what happens? Until they hit another styrofoam cube. Until they hit another styrofoam cube or at least approach one diagonally. And now in this cartoon here, the left proximity sensor can see this second styrofoam cube and does what all most Breitenberg vehicles do, which is turn away. And the moment that it does that, it leaves the styrofoam cube where it is. Why does that result in cleaning up the arena? Exactly, right? So they start to clump up, just given these Three simple rules. As an alternative to programming a swarm of robots to recognize cubes, move towards cubes, pick up the cube, then go looking for the closest, largest clump, turn towards the clump, drive towards the clump. When you get sufficiently close to the clump, stop, put down the cube, leave it, turn around, go find another cube. That internal complexity is not necessary if we think carefully about the kinds of interactions that arise, not just from this set of simple heuristics, but the simple uh, interactions that arise by designing the shape of the robot itself. So if we really think carefully about the interaction between a robot and its environment, there is a lot of physical interaction that has to do with shape and friction and momentum and inertia. And if we think carefully about those potential interactions and design them just right, we can get robots that clean up with very, very simple rules. Yeah. So sort of a physical instantiation of HCI, thinking carefully about interaction design to get away with very simple rules for a useful task. Okay, so let's move on to robot swarms. We would like to have not just one or, a two, one or two or a dozen, but maybe hundreds or thousands of physical machines. The Boyd's algorithms may be useful here. Um, what else do we tend to see in very large groups, especially in human groups? We start to see a division of labor. So Boyd's are all well and good, but they can only do so much and then we need to switch to something like swarm chemistry where we have different subgroups that specialize to start to do things slightly different from one another. Here's a sort of physical version of swarm chemistry. We've got a bunch of robots here, red, green, uh, and blue. They can detect their relative neighbors and they're trying to find their group. And some of them are doing a better job than others. There we go. Okay. So now they have autonomously divided uh, into their groups. They're running this relatively simple algorithm, which is again a sort of a, a slight elaboration on Breitenberg vehicles and Boyd's cluster into groups. Um, once they uh, get into their groups, they elect a leader and the robots move towards the leader of each group. So in the center of the blue patch there, there was the blue leader saying we're over here and same thing with red. Uh, and green, and then uh, in a subsequent video, you can see these groups, they start to move off and do whatever their respective tasks uh, are. You can go read more about this on the URL provided. So we've got centralized control here. We have a single leader. As we saw in the Starlings example, and in most uh, animal species, there is no central leader. Why not? What's the problem with centralized control? Single point of failure, right? What happens if the battery for the blue leader goes flat? Yeah. 
So uh, usually what's done these days in uh, collective robotics projects is to focus on decentralized control where robots only talk to their neighbors. So the Boyd's algorithm is making its way back into robotics to achieve decentralized control. Uh, this is sometimes known as collective robotics or modular robots. So modular robots are made up of robot modules where each individual module is itself a robot and has limited sensing and movement capabilities. The idea is any single robot module can't do much on its own, so it needs to find and attach to other modules so that together they can do something beyond the ability of any one module. This is the Polybot, which is one of the very first uh, modular robots that came out of Xerox Park. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, the Xerox Park Research Center was sort of the, the Google of its day. Let's look at uh, a few more recent modular robots. This is the Conroe robot out of the University of Southern California. Again, uses decentralized control and uses sort of a riff on the Boyd's algorithm, which is each module that makes up the Conroe robot is going to run a relatively simple heuristic, but it's going to choose from a set of heuristics, and the particular heuristic that it chooses to run is going to be a function of how many neighbors are attached to it. So in this cartoon example here, this module has two neighbors, so it's going to run a particular heuristic, but if at any point it has three neighbors, it will switch to a different heuristic. Okay. What are these heuristics? Well, as you'll see when they turn the Conroe robot, robot on, the heuristics are mostly oscillate at a certain frequency. And you can see that uh, they just turned on the back of this, the snake-configured Conroe robot, and the neighbors are communicating with one another. Now all of the modules are running a particular heuristic. The two modules on the end, on the front and the back, only have one neighbor. They're running a particular version of this oscillation. All the other inner units have two neighbors, and they're running a slightly different version of this oscillation. There's now one module that has three neighbors, and that same module now switches to have four neighbors. So that module in the center with four neighbors starts to do something slightly different. You can probably imagine where this is going. So in this case, the idea is to derive a set of heuristics as a function of uh, neighbor so that when the robot is reconfigured, whatever its shape is, it continues to move, in this case, to the upper right. Not an easy thing to come up with a simple set of rules that will give rise to these uh, to that robust behavior. In this case, they derived those rules by hand, which was just on the edge of competency. You could imagine for more complex robots, you'd probably want to use a machine learning algorithm to try and discover those heuristics that lead to that robust global behavior. Okay, uh, what's the obvious? Yep. They did not, these were roboticists, and they said, we don't need simulation, we're smart enough to figure this out using the hardware directly, which, again, is possible for simple hardware. Difficult to scale this up. Difficult to scale this up uh, because, of it, be, because it's difficult to derive the heuristics for desired global behavior, and also because this isn't 
perfectly manual, right? You have a human that is doing the reconfiguration. So you can imagine where this is going. Simple, same idea, simple heuristics, different heuristics when you have different numbers of neighbors, but the heuristics now do different things. Instead of just oscillating uh, an individual module, they can also turn on and off magnets that cause the modules to attach and detach from one another. Okay, taking this one step further, this is a project that I was involved with at Cornell a few years ago. Uh, same thing, we've got a set of modules in this case. They are also going to autonomously reconfigure one another, but not just reconfigure, we are going to supply additional modules from the quote unquote outside, and the robots are going to incorporate those additional modules into themselves to achieve self-reproduction. The plates on the floor are magnetized and provide power. So these additional cubes that we're supplying as food uh, are unpowered until the robot connects to them and supplies power to them. And is able to make a copy of itself. And if we take away the copy, which we'll do in a moment. We take away, or we take away the parent in this case and continue to supply the child with food, it will continue to create copies uh, of itself. You'll notice that during the self-replication process, as the child robot is being built, it's not passive it will start to also move to aid in its own construction. Uh, not, easy, not easily, so module robotics has been a, an idea that's been around for a long time. As you can see in the case of these robots, they are cut along the grand diagonal, and there's a single rotational motor inside the cube, so that uh, uh, the, the half of the cube rotates and doesn't rotate very far outside the design envelope of the cube itself. So in order for these things to work well, you want them to sort of stay within their own volume as they're reconfiguring as much as possible. It's kind of a rule of thumb for designing these kinds uh, of robots. You can, as you can imagine, when we published this work, there was a lot of media attention and the media was mortified about this, uh, these devices. Aren't they gonna take over the world? And we said, yes, as long as you keep supplying them with cubes of themselves. So as long as you don't feed them, they're not going anywhere. Fourteen years ago. Yes. Okay. Yep. So what if they, they can manufacture themselves? What if they can manufacture their own food? Then we're really in trouble. Okay. <laughs> until then. Until then. Okay. So uh, again, this isn't a class in robotics. We're looking at this from an HCI point of view. We have interactions between individual modules inside the parent or inside the child but also interactions between the parent and child robots themselves, where again, they interact in an intelligent way so that the programming inside any one cube is relatively simple. Yet again, the programming inside the cube is really not that different from a Breitenberg vehicle. If I sense a cube in front of me, but it's not attached to me, then attach rotate the motor about my grand diagonal, which rotates the new cube above me, and so on and so forth. Pretty, pretty simple. Um, what's the mindset of the designing such a uh, robot? So we only think about one block. Yes. And we do thought experiments to imagine how 
So the, the idea behind this is, again, there's some task we would like the robots to carry out, like, for example, clear the snow on campus this morning. Mm -hmm. We know as human designers that one robot is not going to do it, and 100,000 robots are going to clog the campus, and that's also not going to work. So we need more than one robot, but less than 10,000. It's not very clear how many. Do we need 10 big robots, 100 small robots? The idea for this technology would be eventually that they would figure it out for themselves. There would be some warehouse of raw robot materials and they would configure themselves into an appropriate swarm for whatever the task is. We're a long way from that, from that scenario, but that's, that's the idea behind the technology. Okay. Okay, so let's take what we've just talked about in terms of robot-robot interaction. And if you like, you can also draw on the discussion you had last week with Josh Powers about human-robot interaction. So humans and robots working together. And also thinking carefully about how an individual robot senses and reacts, uh, acts and reacts to its environment. And with a neighbor, I'd like you to sketch out a simple robot using uh, modular robots or a swarm of robots where either they're running some version of the Boyd's algorithm or a Breitenberg vehicle where they can infiltrate a disaster site and there's a photo to give you an idea about the kinds of physical context that uh, exists in a disaster site. We want to create robots that can move into, into the rubble uh, and detect human survivors and report the positions in the rubble of human survivors back to a human rescue team. Okay, how many robots would you use? How many modules per, per robot? How might they configure? How would they work together? Obviously, this is a very big task. You might want to start with your neighbor thinking about how you would even just create simple rules for a modular robot like this to climb stairs. I'll give you about five, maybe 10 minutes to sketch this out. Again, you don't really need to solve the whole problem. Break it down into some of the sub behaviors here, like being able to move into an irregularly sized aperture. And what are the simple rules that you'll need to get your robot to do that? Okay, but I'll give you five or 10 minutes and then we'll see what you came up with. Good luck. Sorry? By yourself? Uh, with, with your neighbor. Turn to your neighbor and see if uh, uh, you can start to figure this out. So then if you're if you're 
here, right, and these two keys are plugged, these both keys are just going to be plugged. Yeah, it's going to be I think that that's how you would have a gap down to stairs. Okay, not an easy task or something we're going to solve in one morning, but let's do a little bit of brainstorming. Let's start by coming at this from an HCI perspective. What are the physical contexts? What, what are some aspects of physical context at a disaster site like this that influenced your thinking about your robot swarm or your modular robot system? The size of the tunnels, which, as you can probably imagine from this picture, are fractal, right? You're going to have a few very large apertures, and further in to the, into the site, they're going to be increasingly smaller apertures. So there is a distribution of sizes. There could be hazards like debris or fire. Absolutely. So fire, debris, objects that are fragile and move if touched. They may not be. Absolutely, right? How does that influence your thinking about the robots that are going to try and penetrate this uh, mound of rubble? Uh, 
want them to be small, lightweight, and disposable. So very small, lightweight, and disposable because a lot of them are not going to make it back out again. So definitely we want some sort of distributed solution, which is a robot swarm or a, a, a self-reconfigurable modular system. We're obviously not going to send in one very large robot. That doesn't make any sense here. What else about physical context influences design choices about the robots? Maybe. It may or may not, depending, or um, you'd have to consider uh, if it, there's a railing in the stairs. Um, okay. And so like DRC so had that with the, to hold, the robot could hold on to the stairs. The, the DARPA stairs. robotics challenge, yeah. right. So maybe, again, this is was a site built for humans. Maybe we can use that. But wheels maybe doesn't make sense. We want something that touches the surfaces as little as possible. If they were all large apertures, drones would probably be the best choice but we're going to have to create something that's able to penetrate through very small apertures. So maybe drones are useful for part of the rubble site. I would say something spider-like with the amount of legs and puppet reverse any jacket or any So probably we want something with legs or arms that can hold pieces in place while moving and try and uh, perturb the environment as little as possible. When we deploy our robot swarm into this site, we want them to look for human survivors. So they want, we want them to penetrate as far into, the, into this, uh, the rubble as possible and distribute themselves. So flocking is maybe not possible inside this environment, but we do want them to trace different paths. How would we get them to spread out inside this environment? Again, by thinking carefully about the environment itself. Maybe like an ant, so move randomly, and uh, if you find something, you left some chemical. Okay, so we discussed the ants, how they go about finding uh, food sources. They do it again by leaving tags in the environment. So we could imagine the swarm leaving simple tags that communicate to other robots, I've been here before, that might be useful. Absolutely. So have them go in together and they split up when they reach a fork. That would be a way to ensure that they distribute themselves among the rubble. Other ideas? Assuming they need to communicate with each other to get back to whatever, wherever the rescuers are, you would have them stay within like contact range, but as far to the edges of that range as possible so that they don't, like, so you're using them as efficiently as possible. Exactly. So again, thinking about physical context, imagining that a robot does penetrate towards the center of the rubble and finds a human survivor deep in the rubble, that is a very important piece of information. But the robot itself is probably not going to be able to signal wirelessly outside this mass of material. You might want to set up a chain gang where you have robots at each fork in the path and they communicate information back out so they don't leave each other's sensing radius, right? Again, thinking about the context here. Absolutely, right? So again, we could imagine that way, we are setting up robot waypoints, perhaps in the rubble, and they're signaling left or right uh, where there is a human survivor and where there isn't. You probably want all the robots to carry some kind of sonar device so that they could construct a map of like internal pathways in the rubble as they go, so that once they get back and say, "Oh, there's people here and here," then you can try to find a way to get. Po possibly. We could imagine adding some complexity to the robots where they actually try and construct a map individually or collectively. But as HCI designers, we might want to pause at this point and ask whether that's necessary or not. Would, the ch would a branching network of waypoint robots be enough to be able to signal ways in and out of, uh, of the rubble? Or maybe a map would be useful. Again, it depends on the specific circumstances.
Exactly, right? So how do the robots detect distance between one another? They could simply move apart and at the time instant in which they can no longer sense their neighbor, they stop and move one step in the direction they just came, right? So with relatively, with a relatively simple Breitenberg vehicle, we could imagine robots that become stationary just at the edge of their neighbor's sensing range. And if they do that collectively, they might be able to create a distributed network inside the rubble where they can rapidly communicate information downstream and upstream and back out of the rubble site. Okay, again, this is probably not something that we're going to build in practice, but thinking carefully about interaction and avoiding trying to create very complex robots that are figuring out the shortest path inside a map that's been constructed uh, and so on. We have uh, two minutes left, so let's just use these two minutes to introduce our next topic which we'll start in on uh, on Thursday. As I mentioned, we're now going to start to think about humans interacting not with the physical environment, but interacting with the virtual environment. And we're going to start by thinking about how to architect and design that virtual environment as carefully as possible, so that actions that are sent, instead of being sent to the physical environment, are sent to the virtual environment. We receive the kinds of sensory repercussions we would have expected if we performed the same actions in a physical environment. Okay, I think we'll leave things there. You have a quiz due tonight, and I will see you on Thursday. Thank you.